Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I'm just back from a phenomenal trip. I've made a commitment to myself once a month, once a month to take off and just be in nature and try something significant. Um, I've re I really pushed my body recently, and, and I'm fascinated by what it can do. And I did an eight hour hike. I've, I've done two marathons in my life, but this was, <laughs> it's been a while. So eight hours of hiking, amazing, in some of the most magical forest I have ever been in. So grateful, so grateful to see that kind of beauty and perfection. And I also did a dive, if you will, which really means that I lowered myself via rocks into some waterfalls and I wanted to so badly and it was so scary to be honest because all the rocks were really slippery. Um, there was no railing to hold on to. You weren't really sure how cold, how deep, how shallow, uh, what was down there. But um, I wanted to so much and you know, the universe always has my back. I'm just always supported and taken care of. And sure enough, we had two couples who came by my boyfriend and I were there and we had two couples. We were both a little trepidatious there and they were snowboarders, took total risks in their life, fearless, literally fearless people who jump off of mountains and do things like how perfect. And they came, one of the fellows anyway, boom, went right in and showed us how he helped me get in the water. Um, we had great conversation. It was such nice people. They left and took off and it was just the two of us. And I'm like, you know, I'll be damned if I'm leaving this pool, this gorgeous freezing cold pool that I am now swimming in without this bucket list moment of literally putting my whole body and head under a waterfall. And I did, uh, Rob captured it on camera and it was so exhilarating, that feeling of no regrets, of wanting something so much, not being sure, having doubts and going for it and the joy of giving yourself something you desire at that level. So simple, and yet it was monumental for me. So a beautiful weekend and just back and so, so grateful to be with you guys again for yet another sumptuous conversation. I wanna thank Dr. Dean here, H-E-E-R, and Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show. They do beautiful energy work all around the world. You can take their classes online, read their books, products, and just learn they've got lots of free stuff Go to accessconsciousness.com, well worth it. And uh, this show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. It is in the top 100 best podcasts in the USA in self-improvement. And that's on Apple Podcasts. And it's also marked in the top 50 podcasts in Portugal and Canada and France and uh, several other countries. So I'm so grateful all of you around the world globally are joining us. And what I do out in the world is I am a visibility shaman or coach, if you will. And I teach people visibility, specifically how to write a page turner book, how to turn that book into a guaranteed international bestseller and how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get great results. So I show people how to find and use media exposure to completely locate your tribe, sell out workshops, webinars, sell your books and other things. And if you would like more information about any of that or to receive some free gifts and tools, go to debbie-inger.com, D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com. Be my joy to have a conversation with you if you'd like to know more. So the question today is, do you want to move and shift what's going on for you around abundance and prosperity? I know that I do. I'm always looking to understand that because it influences so much in our life, not just money, but all the allowances and receiving that we have in our life. My guest today is Glenn Harold, who is an author, musician, and experienced clinical hypnotherapist who's helped thousands of clients. And he's been on a wide range helping people with stress-related problems. He's combined his hypnotherapy skills with an extensive recording knowledge to produce a uniquely effective series of high quality hypnosis recordings that have been downloaded over 10 million times. 
and they are very well established in the UK. And he is known for best selling self help audio titles of all time. Glenn also writes self help books for Orion in the UK and McCraw Grill. Mc, that's funny, I'm mixing two names, but it's McGraw Hill in the USA. And he produces hypnotherapy recordings. He's been number one in self help audio over the last seven years. He has 20 years experience as a clinical hypnotherapist in one-to-one -one therapy sessions. And in recent years, he has worked with many high profile people and celebrity clients. And in 2011, he was made a fellow of the British Society of Clinical Hypnosis for his achievements in the world of hypnotherapy. Let me give you some links because he's got a gift for you. It's glennharold.com and it's G-L-E-N-N-H-A-R-R-O-L-D.com. And if you'd like your free gift, go to glennharold.com slash mindfulness slash download dash no sign up dot html i know that's a mouthful don't worry go to youtube.com slash debbie dashinger or any of the podcast sites and you will see that information in the show notes and i welcome glenn to the dare to dream show it is so great to have you hello debbie it's really fabulous to be here from portugal sunny portugal in uh in southern europe how did you end up there? Um, it was about five years ago that we left the UK and we came down to uh, Spain initially. And um, yeah, we love Spain. It was a great place to live. And then Portugal's right next door. And we liked the school. I've got a couple of young kids. So we liked the schools over here. They were, we're kind of into sort of the homeschooling sort of vibe and uh, that kind of thing. And so some of the schools over here were very sort of supportive of that. Um, so we, we're doing a bit of homeschooling and a bit of sort of nature schooling as well. Well, so yeah, kind of we business, love it it's like pick up and go. I mean, you can do it anywhere in the world. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. I mean, for a long, long time, I sold CDs and cassettes because I was selling them, you know, back in the uh, 2000s. And I bought a big warehouse in the Southern UK to have all, hold all the cassettes and we were shipping them out. So I was kind of restricted when I was doing that. But as soon as everything went digital and it was all about the MP3 downloads and apps, it gave me the freedom to then live anywhere in the world. And as soon as I got that opportunity, I was out of the UK very quickly. Because, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the UK for giving me the opportunities I had. You know, I probably wouldn't have been able to do what I've done here. Yeah. But... It's, it rains all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it rains. Oh, you know. It rains. There's lots of traffic. People are quite angry there. And, you know, I needed, some, I needed somewhere where the sun shines yeah. and the people are very laid back and cool. And in Portugal, we've got that. It's a great place. Ditto. That's why I'm in California. I totally yeah. get it. Sun, yeah. great people, cool people, beautiful places to go. It's really interesting to hear you talk about everything going digital and creating that freedom for you, because that's how I first found you. I don't know how long ago it was, but whenever all of this came about, you had, when apps, right? We first got smartphones and we found out about apps and somehow I did a search. I don't know how I found you, but I found you. I know it was meant to be. I downloaded your app. I bought a bunch of your meditations and it changed my life and I'll tell you why I think this is really important uh, for people who are looking for hypnotherapy and ways to really uh, release stress and change things in their lives I am so sensitive that frankly I I don't care for most meditations that are spoken or hypnotherapy in fact I find them they do the opposite. I'm so aware of the person talking and talking and talking that I actually can't relax. Whatever it is you do and how you do it and your voice, it would put me in a trance. Uh, it was so beautiful. And I just started doing it every single day. And I found that you know profound things were happening. Whatever you were saying, 
and suggesting was taking place. And then the fact of these just sort of a, like a lake, you know, this pure stillness that I was able to achieve with you for those 30, 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful for digital and for finding you and for what you put out in the world because your work has had a great effect for me. Mm, well, that's lovely to hear that, you know, it really is. And I think, you know, nowadays there's so much choice out there, so much variety, isn't there? Um, you know, and it's like somebody can go through a college and get a, a certificate saying they're a master therapist in a couple of weeks and plug their microphone into their computer and make a meditation recording and upload it. But there's no substitute for the hard work you do to, to create something that's got real value. And for me, I started as a hypnotherapist 25 years ago and I wanted to, you know, and I literally saw thousands of clients before I made my first recording. Mm. So I understood, you know, I became good as a hypnotherapist. You know, I did my apprenticeship, if you like. And then I'd, I'd always kept a little recording studio in my house because I've been a musician since I was young. And so I kind of married the two together, my hypnotherapy sort of knowledge and recording knowledge. And from the off, I was able to make half decent recordings. You know, that they were you know, good therapy and the technical side was up to scratch. Mm. And, but I always, you know, I always had a real passion for helping and healing people because, you know, just to give you a little bit of my backstory, I was a very um, uh, delinquent kid. You know, I ran with a bad gang. I got in lots of trouble. I was kicked out of school when I was seven, uh, 15, had no qualifications, you know, very broken home life. And it was, it's kind of what led me into hypnotherapy later on because I was looking to fix a lot of the dysfunction and the uh, programming and conditioning that I had that was holding me back. Mm. So hypnotherapy gave me that opportunity. You know, I suddenly saw a tool that I could change from the inside out and clear those failure programs. And over time I did that. And as I said, I became a hypnotherapist. And after a few years, I was you know, getting great results with people. And then when I started making the first recordings, you know, I put a lot of love and good intention into them. And even now, before I record, you know, I've got a really, you know, I've got a great Neumann mic and, you know, very good equipment to record through. And I'm a bit of a perfectionist now because so many people listen to the recordings. I really have to be in the zone. You know, sometimes my voice doesn't sound right. I'll go on the mic and no, I'm not quite right. You know, I'm, I'm too much in my throat, not in my heart. And so I try to always project from my heart and put the feeling, the intention into the recording because I know people will pick up on that when they listen to them. And, um, you know, so there's a lot of thought and care in what I do now and, and, and good intention. So I think, yeah, people pick, pick up on that. So it's lovely to hear you say what you said and, you know, especially if you've listened to a lot of recordings. Yeah. I listen and then I sort of reject them because they're not going to work. And I mean, I now at this point, I have an old iPod. I still love iPods. I use them yeah. for travel and, and I use them for sleep. And um, occasionally I just need to pull it out. And, you know, if I'm agitated or it's just not happening, but I'll just listen. I've got, I stream a godzillion of yours and I'm just, poof, mm. I'm gone. And I figure when I wake up, like, you know, what a great thing to do. While you, while you yeah. leave your body and sleep. Um, so that's very interesting because I think that's par for the course that people who have a wound and are brave enough to take it on to heal inherently on the other side when they've mm. received wisdom, you know, they've been changed by virtue of going on this journey to heal their insides, then they have this wisdom and gift to impart. It's almost like mm. you're supposed to go through that to get to the other side. Mm. And, uh, absolutely yeah that's so true there's no substitute for having that real life experience and healing yourself from the inside out and then you know being it to help others go on that same journey and they sense it they know you're not doing it you're not read it from a textbook you're doing it from you know real life experience and they they connect with you so yeah i love that journey and i love helping people you know make the break did you hypnotize your wife to fall in love with you? <laughs> Do you know what? It's, there's a funny story with that because she's also a hypnotherapist. Ah. 
So I can never use hypnosis with Nick because she's smart. You know, she gets it. She, you're not, you know, no, Nick's, um, but she uh, used to listen to my recordings years and years ago when she was quite young. Mm. Uh, and um, it was actually through hearing me being mentioned on a TV show that she joined my Facebook fan page and then, yeah, we, we got chatting and that, that was the journey we got, you know, and we, we kind of, um, you know, help each other a lot on, on that because Nick also makes recording and actually on insight timer, which is the biggest meditation app in the world. We're both, uh, Nick's had great success on there as well. She's had 4 million plays. I've had 6 million and yeah, we, there's a lot of synchronicity in what we're doing, but, um, but no, I can never use hypnosis at home only with the kids. With the kids, well, that's got to be very helpful, I'm sure. <laughs> it, do you know that genuinely can be? My older son, he still remembers because when he was young, I I just learned, I just became a hypnotherapist. So I used to help him with exams and any challenge he had in his life. I'd, you know, with kids, you use a gentle form of hypnosis. You know, lots of colourful stories with metaphors, that kind of thing. So I was able to really program Lee for big challenges in life and to help him overcome things and exams. And so he never had felt the pressure that a lot of normal kids do because I kind of used that. And, and now he's become a hypnotherapist. He's 33, my older boy, and he's a hypnotherapist and he's a, he's brilliant. You know, I don't tend to see clients so much, but I recommend them. I point them to Lee and he's getting amazing results, you know, straight off the bat. He's not been doing it long, but he's, he's, so we're creating a bit of a dynasty between us all. <laughs> A hypnotherapy dynasty. Well, you know, I was thinking about you knowing that you were coming on the show and being away. And um, one of the things, it, here, here's something so interesting that I didn't even piece this together. I went, ah, oh, I'm, I'm interviewing Glenn. Like, it's a perfect question. So I recently, I've been going through a lot of limitations. Left side of my body, my hip, my leg, my lower back, my right arm rotator cuff. I, I'm so over it. I see a really exquisite chiropractor who helps me a lot, and I run cellular frequency. I do lots of stuff, you know, Epsom salt baths, stretch, but I'm active. I love using my body, and I feel incredibly limited. I am also getting better, but it's by increments. And I'm with a guy who is extremely strong and athletic, climbs mountains like a goat, and I because of my physical limitations, I'm having trouble keeping up. So all of that to say, I suddenly thought this weekend, during this eight hour epic um, camping, hiking trip, I suddenly thought, oh, I wonder if I went to a hypnotherapist because there's always that comp component that emotions get lodged in the body that are unresolved. And I thought, hey, I'm willing. What if a hypnotherapist could actually create a shift there so all of that could be released. Um, mm -hmm. And I know, and I'm going to be really honest, I have some even limiting thoughts about age, what, oh, what the age I am and, you know, what happens to the body. And it's like, poof. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that. Like, is it possible to get results around things like that? What's possible? Yeah. I mean, what, what kind of thing is holding you back and stopping you from you know, really doing what you want to do? Is it something physical you're holding in the body? Is it some kind of tightness or? Yes, it's extremely tight, actually. Right. And I have had this, my, not this pain, but I am, I'm, I'm able at some level, if you will, to sort of see the matrix of what goes on inside of me. And I will tell you with total transparency, I've had this around my body my whole life. I've always felt very weird in my body and right. like I'm dragging something around and like, it doesn't quite work like other bodies, which, mm. yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's interesting. You know, that's taking it a bit deeper, isn't it? That you're, you know, not feeling totally comfortable in your body in that way. You know? So I think, yeah, definitely hypnotherapy would help you with that because there may be some kind of block there that needs resolving and, uh, some kind of integration work. I don't know. Um, but I, from what you've said there, yeah, I, I definitely think you could be helped in that way. I'm trying to think of um, a client session that I'm, I could talk about that's uh, 
where I've worked on somebody with that kind of issue, but yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, you can, you can definitely do that. And, um, you know, if it is a psychological block because, you know, tightness in the body is just a message from the brain, isn't it? It's, it can be, you know, psychosomatic. And so it's well worth exploring that. I would definitely do that. And, um, and Lee is your man. So leeharold.com. That's my yeah, son. That's He's awesome. I'm on it. I'm yeah. on it. I'm going to, he does these Skype it. sessions and, um, he only started really started doing it since the lockdown. He was seeing clients in person before, but it kind of, because of the lockdown, it prompted him to start seeing Skype people over Skype and, uh, yeah, and he's just now getting busier and busier. It's you just got this momentum going. Lee, hold the space so. for me. And I will let people know because I'm sure people listening have, if it's not something similar, you know, but something in your body, you're like, what is this? How did you show up? Why are you showing up? Clearly you're trying to get my attention and yeah. you're complete on some level with that. Or it could be, you know, you have a phobia or you have an addiction or you have something going on that is not allowing you a full steam ahead kind yeah. of life. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's a, if it's an energetic thing, you know, something, um, you know, trapped in your luminous energy field, if you like, you know, it can be impacting your physical, can't it? And, and Lee's got that sort of knowledge as well. He's very um, spiritually minded. He's spent time in India with the Krishna consciousness guys. And so he can work on a multitude of levels. Okay. Uh, I just have good. to get to him before any of the other listeners do. <laughs> yeah, that's, he's suddenly, yeah, like I say, he's getting busier all the time and, you know, it's, it's good. So today we're talking about creating an abundant, prosperous life and specifically that being in alignment with spiritual principles. I love that as a primary conversation. It feels really, yeah. really delicious right now. During turmoil, it seems to me sometimes there's great opportunity. And there's also a lot of people who can get quite lost. Tell me, why does this subject appeal to you and how does it resonate to right now? Well, I think true abundance comes from having that sort of spiritual element to it and that, um, you know, that ability to give and receive freely. And, and, you know, ultimately we all want to live abundant, happy lives on this planet, you know, and it's sometimes, you know, with the world, like it is at the moment in chaos and you know, there's so much division in the world, it can feel like it's hard to do that. But, you know, I've, I've been doing the work, like I said to you, you know, I had a very troubled younger life. And then when I discovered hypnotherapy, I started to really work on abundance because up until I was in my early thirties, I'd been flat broke. I'd lived in rough parts of South London, you know, around, you know, very colorful people and, uh, you know, drove, drove old bangers for cars that were always breaking down. And, you know, I got so sick of that life. It was struggle. It was heavy and it was low vibrational and, and I wanted out of it, but I just didn't know how. So it was on becoming a hypnotherapist and then using the law of attraction later on that I started to really transform my life. You know, a lot of the failure programming that I had running, I was able to clear that. And it was almost like you think going into a computer and erasing programs. And that's how I did it systematically. I took out all of this failure programming. And I even remember one time I was in a therapy session. I was having, actually having hypnotherapy with someone and I had this memory, this locked memory that I remember seeing my parents when I was about five, having this blazing row over money and they were screaming at each other. And my dad ripped up this money in front of me. And, you know, I was only a little kid. So I'm looking at this and, you know, that's a powerful program that was ticking over in my unconscious mm -hmm. mind. So it was no wonder I was sabotaging things as I got older, but in the hypnotherapy session, I was able to, clear that pattern, get rid of it and just erase the memory and all the emotions that were attached to the memory. And so it was gone. And then what, and then you've got, a, I had a clear slate from there on. Mm -hmm. And so then when I started doing the abundance affirmations and, you know, I really got into them big time. And I used to be saying, you know, I'm always in the right place at the right time. Abundance comes freely and naturally to me. All of my needs are constantly met. And I probably said those affirmations you know, a hundred thousand or more times. I just can, you know, I was doing it in the bath. I was 
doing it when I was driving, I'd have the radio off. And I was also using self-hypnosis to really anchor those suggestions in my unconscious. And, and I slowly became more and more abundant, you know, and all of the things that I visualized, I had a list of goals, you know, I wanted to have a million pound house. I wanted to have a villa in Florida. I wanted to drive an Aston Martin. And over time, well, I, I got all those things. I manifested those things. I became, you know, more abundant than I could ever have dreamed of. And it was just really through working on my unconscious and planting those uh, abundance affirmations and visualizations and really connecting with my feelings as I was doing that. Because when you do the affirmations, if you really supercharge your feelings and you imagine you're driving the car and living in the house or whatever it is, then, then you supercharge it. Mm. And so that was where I wanted to be. You know, I wanted all that, and I got all those things. But for me now, the spiritual aspect is more important because material possessions are nice, but they, they mean nothing without a conscious life, living consciously and uh, operating from your heart. Because I know a lot of multimillionaires who are as mean as they come, you know, and money controls them. They get all their kicks from having power and they're horrible people. I, I, you know, I'm sure we've all met someone like that. You know, so true abundance is about having you know, the opportunities and the money and success, that kind of thing, but also having an open heart and being very generous and, you know, giving and receiving in, in equal measure. And so that's, you know, my focus now, you know, the, the you know, developing my consciousness really, and taking it as high as I can. Can we draw on our passion to magnetize prosperity and abundance? Yeah, I think you can, you know, and I certainly did that, you know, because my passion was, you know, to change my life and, um, you know, and I really wanted to do that. I wanted to become abundant and happy. And it seemed very difficult when I was, because I'd had 30 years on this planet, just struggling and mixing with people that were sort of ducking and diving and coming from a family where it was all about gambling, you know, drinking and you know, and I did a lot of drugs when I was young. You know, so my vibration was very low. So I really wanted out of that. And so when I found a way out, I got so passionate about being on that path, that abundance path. And I would literally immerse myself in it. I was doing everything I possibly could to create an abundant life. And it seemed hard to, I couldn't have imagined living the life I'm at now. And, you know, sometimes I get old acquaintances or friends that I knew, 35 years ago I mixed with and you know and they, they've been in prison and come out of prison and they can't believe I'm writing books and doing this and you know so I've it's, it reminds me sometimes how far I've come from my old life and and it really has just been from the the work I've done without doing the inner work I would never have got the breaks I got the opportunities I've had and because what you do when you work on that and you start to raise your vibration the, the law of attraction works much more effectively because your affirmations, your projections are so much clearer, you know, when you've got a higher vibration. And, and for me, that's the journey. And I'm, I'm a work in progress like everyone is. I'll still be doing this work when I'm 90. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never met anyone who's sorted and worked out. You know, we're all on the journey. One of your passions is music. You're a musician. I've seen photos of you on stage playing with your band. Super exciting. Yeah. How does that passion come into play here? And did you use hypnotherapy to release yourself as a musician, get better as a musician? Well, I suppose my career as a musician came before I became a hypnotherapist because up until I became a hypnotherapist, I'd been... Um, you know, in di different bands and had sort of varying degrees of success, um, but never quite had the big hits and, you know, took off and, you know, never made enough money for long enough to, to live off of it. Um, so I ended up, I ended up on the cabaret circuit, you know, doing bars and restaurants, that kind of thing. And, and then it was one night sharing the bill with us. We shared the bill with the stage hypnotist and I had an epiph epiphany. I saw this guy doing his thing I saw the power of hypnosis up close and I didn't want to do the stage thing. I wanted to do the healing thing. You know, I was into healing. And so I, that's what's prompted me to become a hypnotherapist and to train in it. So then, and once I became a hypnotherapist, these, 
the whole thing started to take off, you know, and I did start to become abundant. So my focus was really in that direction. So now the musical side of thing, things is a sideline. I occasionally re release songs. I've got, I released a couple of songs with a, a singer about two or three years ago. And so every now and again, I take a break from hypnotherapy and, you know, write a few songs and release them. But it's a kind of, and I have no, you know, I still love to have a number one hit, you know, it's an old ambition. Mm. And I still, I always say, right, I'm going to go into this, whatever happens is, you know, the divine's plan. I'm not got any ambition, but I do. Once I get into it and write the song, I want it, I want it to be a hit, but it's still, it's so far, you know, I've sold 10 million meditations, but I've never had a hit song. I'd still love that one opportunity, but I'm very grateful with where I'm at. You know, I can't you kind of, well, you can have everything you can. I shouldn't say that. Yeah. Absolutely. Whatever you want, you know. Concurrent careers. That's phenomenal. Um, I, I'm definitely going to have to listen to one of your songs now. So yeah. I would like to understand more the spiritual and the natural laws of abundance. Are there laws that operate like a recipe to success that you mm -hmm. can share with us? Yeah, well, I think the biggest one for me was the when I got clearer and I got rid of, the, of a lot of the failure programming and the limiting self-beliefs through working on my unconscious, mm -hmm. I then had this, you know, blank slate. And, um, you know, I also really was immersed in spirituality as well. You know, as, as I got into my hypnotherapy career, I, you know, really started to open up in that way. And I went down to uh, Panama and spent four months at a shamanic retreat. Oh, I experienced, wow. yeah, an amazing time down there with a the shaman with, with my wife and, um, also experienced a number of ayahuasca ceremonies, you know, worked with the plant medicine and, you know, really got clear with that. I had some powerful, powerful ceremonies that just, you know, cleared this old, old programming. And one of them that relates to abundance was, and, and, you know, what you've asked me there was that I, in one of my early ayahuasca ceremonies, I was really, really deep. You know, I was so deep in the medicine and journeying with it. And I had this thing that came up where my patriarchal lineage, I was seeing like my dad, my grandfather, his father, as like the, in the rocks of Mount, Mush, Mount Rushmore. So, I was, you know, the presidents are there. Yeah. Well, I was seeing my patriarchal downline, you know, my grandparents and so on and so on. And it was such a strange thing, but they were kind of communicating with me and saying, look, keep doing what you're doing because you're clearing a lot of family mm -hmm. karma. Mm -hmm. And, and I was getting this and really, you know, it was an amazing experience and, and I got it. I totally understood it because there had been money in the family, but it never been passed down and it had all been made in sort of, you know, not the, not the most righteous ways, if you like, you know, my granddad was a bookmaker, a boxer, you know, he ducked and dive and, you know, he was a tough, tough guy who made his living ducking and diving. So that I was getting the message, look, keep doing what you're doing because you're doing it in a heart centered way. You're kind of doing it in the right way and clearing the family karma. So that kind of blew me away. And then when I came out of the ceremony, I researched what I'd experienced and I found that that was a natural byproduct of plant medicine, that you get those messages from your family lineage. And I didn't know that when I was getting the message. So it wasn't like my mind was tricking me into it. It mm. felt really authentic and real. And so that was it, you know, and since that time, I've tried to take my authenticity, if you like, up another level, you know, with every kind of dealing that I ever do. I never work with anyone that I don't feel in alignment with, or I don't resonate with or it's never never now about the money I'd, I'd rather make a million straight than a 10 million dodgy you know there's no pleasure in that at all and so I, I try to do everything I can from a really authentic place and not let my ego trick me or play games and I think that's what the plant medicine does it gives you that authenticity it really clears away a lot of the the shadow stuff mm -hmm. that you can't always see you can't always see it and it's powerful. And yeah, I, I'm, I've met someone recently who does ceremonies out here and I'm going to journey again because I've traveled around a little bit the last couple of years we have as a family and now we're settled. So I feel ready for 
more ceremonies and to get clearer. That's wonderful. Uh, have you done San Pedro or just ayahuasca? San Pedro in micro doses, mm. but not the full experience. Um, and that's something I always feel a strong connection with ayahuasca because I know more about it than some of the other uh, sort of medicines that come from different places around the world. But yeah, that's, that's the calling. I think you're, you, you get called, they say the medicine calls you when you're ready. And for me, it's always been ayahuasca. Yeah, a hundred percent. I had so much judgment about it. Somebody had invited me in a, you know, like a year ago or more. And I was like, what? Why would I do that? That's so strange. Drink something for four days. And yeah. And then two months later, boom, I had the calling and I just had to start following energy and going to different countries. And, oh, it's so prevalent in my life now. We do, yeah. we do journeys here. We, well, I, I guess I can't say too much, but we yeah. have harvested some of our own San Pedro and had those experiences. And even, you know, while camping did mushrooms and which we're considering medicine at this point, because it's been so profound. Oh, yeah. My gosh. Yeah. Some of the, um, it's, a, it's incredible, isn't it? It's, it? These are gifts, you know, they're gifts from the design, the divine, aren't they? You know, if you think ayahuasca is a combination of a vine and a plant that's indigenous to certain parts of South America and, you know, in jungles where there are thousands of plants, the shamans knew, always knew that it was those two plants in combination that gave you this incredible spiritual journey and the opportunity to clear and heal and yeah, it's, it's a wonderful journey. And, and I think, yeah, it sounds like you're on a similar path where you just have this calling to use this life in such a productive way to get clearer and lighter. And, you know, for me, I, I, I sometimes joke that I don't want to incarnate into a 3D world, into the same family with all the baggage again. I want to get as clear as I can. So, you know, I'm ascending to a higher <laughs> vibrational place. Hopefully that, that's how it all works. We'll find yeah. out. I can relate. Well, that, this is so beautiful. Thank you for opening up about that. I also think it's very uh, profound path for those who are called to it. And um, so within all of that, and I agree with you so much on the shadow work, what, what is possible to release as well as what is impossible, what is possible to invite in um, conversations with the divine healings on the body and the emotions. I mean, it's spectacular. Mm. What about managing money? Cause I also think mm. there are different components to money. There is receiving, allowing, bringing in, um, yeah. and making your jar, if you will, bigger and bigger. But mm. there's also the, once we have the money, how we manage it, because there are some people who just whew, piss it away. Right. So quickly. Yeah. That it's like, ah, oh, I had it and now I'm in the same soup again. How can we manage money? Um, is there a system in order that's to a, work for us? That's a really good question because it's, you know, a lot of the time, you know, I used to think when I got money, then life sorted, you know, I've got everything I want. I can have what I want, travel where I want. And that's a lot of that's true. But then there's also the thing of managing it, like you say, and looking after it, you know, because when you've got it, it's easy to, you know, you can have sabotage programs running there that will blow opportunities. And, you know, I mean, I, I actually did. I had a cup, I had sabotage patterns where I was attracting uh, people that were ripping me off. Uh -huh. And, and it was really, uh, it happened a couple of times. And, you know, I think this is where your consciousness comes in. And, and, and if you see a pattern in your life, you then look at it, you know, rather than feeling victimized about it, you start to think, well, why is this happening? What, what is in me that's attracting this energy? And I went into it. I went into that and looked at it. And there was something in me that was attracting these people that, yeah, were ripping me off. And, you know, I wasn't on the face of it. It all seemed very good. And, you know, but as I got into things, I was yeah, vulnerable and and it was a feeling that I couldn't trust people. I had this lack of trust issue that came from my childhood. And it was only when I cleared that, I was able to clear that belief system and that programming from my unconscious mind that that pattern then resolved itself and I didn't attract these people anymore. So it's really important to be aware of that kind of thing. And also, as you said, you know, how do you manage money? Well, another thing 
that's really, you know, a gift that you've got is your intuition. And your intuition is never better at guiding you than when you need to make a big decision with money. You know, is this the right house to buy? Is this the right investment? Um, and I've always meditated on that. So when I've, you know, decided, do I buy crypto now? Do I buy gold now? What's the right time? I would meditate on that and I'd go deep inside and I'd allow my intuition to guide me. And it's never, ever failed me in that way. And, you know, conversely, when I've used my mind to try and you know, think of an opportunity, is this, you know, right way? And I'm just using the conscious part of my mind. It's let me down a few times. So I would say, always, always use your intuition to guide you um, to, you know, to navigate the way through the, the waters. You know, is this the right decision? And, um, you know, I've always, and I've been so lucky. I've been so opportunistic. Things have come to me at the right time, the right place. I've met the right people. But as I said to you at the beginning, that was my affirmation. I'm always in the right place at the right time. Abundance comes freely and naturally to me. And that's, that's happened. So the, use your intuition, your inner resources to really guide you. Yeah, that discernment is really interesting to me. One thing that I've noticed uh, that creates a lot of limitations or sabotage for people also is when they don't have money for a period of time and there is that needing to let go of, oh, I can't get this right now, maybe later, I can't do that right now, and it builds. And then suddenly I've seen people have money, come into money, and then boom, I wanted that, I, I need to buy this. There's this flurry of mm. purchases to make up for all that time of not having and then the diminishment is rather quick it's like the soul <laughs> has been hungry for so long and suddenly there's a buffet and they're you know pigging out gorging yeah right and you know on the one hand it's like oh the relief of finally acquiring and giving oneself what, what you feel like you wanted or needed sometimes i'm sure there's need in their requirement and then at the same time it's uh there's just so much going on that everything you've just finally gotten is moving away just as rapidly as it came in. Yeah. And that can be sabotage patterns. Again, it can be that you suddenly come into money and you think you don't deserve it on some level. There can be that. So there can be the sabotage thing going on and yeah. And, and the materialistic acquisitions, you know, that's something that can get hold of you. You know, you can, you know, because I remember, you know, when I got my Aston Martin for the first time, suddenly, you know, everywhere you go, people look at you and, and I kind of had to get it out of my system. You know, I had to go have a couple of years of that, you know, and, and experience it to realize that material possessions mean nothing if you haven't got, you know, your, you know, your heart in the right place and abundance in your, you know, abundance of love in your life. And, you know, it sounds cliched, but it's true. You know, it's, you've got to, you know, balance, you have the work, right uh, balance in your life, you know, have the abundance and the material success, but also work on your spirituality and your, you know, your relationships and that kind of thing. That's something that I balanced it out after a couple of years. You know, I was, I remember having a, having the car and really enjoying that, enjoying the material side of it. But I, I knew I'd been on the spiritual path for long enough then to know that it wasn't the be all and end all. You know, there's a lot more to life than just having a fancy car. And, and it was gradual for me. You know, I'd, I'd spent so long broke and been really humbled when I was younger, you know, really humbling experiences and being at the bottom of the heap, driving a mini cab around the West End, you know, at night time. And I met some real weird and wonderful characters there. You know, it was a bit like the, sort of Robert De Niro film, you know, the taxi driver. And I'm glad I had those experiences because it taught me a lot. And, you know, it, it did give me a humility. So when I started to get the su success, you know, I've had the success in recent years, it's been a good uh, balance to have that start and, you know, to come, to come gradually into this more abundant life. And that, that idea that you were talking about, which I think comes into play with everything you just talked about, including love. 
if we were to use our intuition, we'll be well guided. And in theory, that's beautiful. But what do you use specifically? So when you go into a meditation, can you talk us through a bit how you use it, how you set yourself up in a field so that your truth can come forward? Yeah, I think, um, you know, when you go into a state of meditation, you're you're accessing the greater part of your mind. You know, if you think of it, we're the only species on the planet, planet that doesn't use all of its mind all the, all the time, all of its brain all the time, I should say. You know, we, I've got this huge resource that, you know, we drop down into when we go to sleep or when we use self-hypnosis or meditation, we drop down into that greater part of the mind. And if you think of an iceberg, that's a good analogy. The conscious mind is the bit above the surface and then you've got this huge resource below. And, you know, when I've been in that state, you know, through meditation, self-hypnosis or plant medicine, I've had these massive revelations and I've tapped into the sort of creative genius inside me that we've all got. Everyone's got this genius part of themselves that you access when you're in these altered states of consciousness. And so for me, if ever I'm stuck in life or I'm not feeling very creative or, you know, I need to know which way to go in life, I always go down into that state. I drop down into a deep state and ask for my creativity and my intuition to guide me. And when you do that, you, you always get pointed in the right way, you know, because, yeah, who knows? You know, we're also, you know, I believe we're being helped and guided by, you know, our helpers and angels and you know light forces light beings that are, are with us in this life and are here to assist us so you can also access that you know in these deeper states of consciousness mm. so I, I i love it and i use it i still use it all the time when i need guidance i love that and i'm thinking about something you and i shared together before the show even started and um, we were talking about light versus darkness right now and a lot of choices right now about where we can live so interesting you bring that up because my boyfriend and i have decided to watch star wars from the very beginning through which has been fascinating yeah <laughs> of course it's all about that the force the light versus the darkness and yeah when you're talking about asking, please bring me my creativity, bring me my intuition to guide me right now. I'm just feeling into also the ability to say, and bring me the light, bring me the light mm. to guide me and to show me yeah. what is light and right for me, for my path. Yeah. That's another great question because, you know, at the moment we, you know, there's all this craziness in the world, isn't there? You know, you've got the government saying these crazy, you know, they're getting more and more mad every day and it's hard to know what's, what's right. You know, you look at the, you know, I go down the rabbit hole sometimes and look deep into that. And you know, there's even people divided down the rabbit hole, you know, believe one thing and they're f the Q and non stuff. That's got a big, a lot of profile. Now there's so much information. You've got counter conspiracy in the middle. That's all very confusing and muddy in the waters. And, you know, it's no wonder people are feeling a lot of fear and anxiety. And, you know, it's, it's a very unusual world, a world that we couldn't have imagined even in January. You could, if somebody had told you what the world that we're going to be living in now in January, we'd have thought they were a conspiracy nut job mm -hmm. because it's, it's gone so crazy. And it, to me, as, as we talked about earlier, it feels like there's a battle in this world between dark forces and light forces, and it's a power struggle. You know, the, and, you know, they're battling it in a lot of different ways. You know, there's so many things going on that, and it's hard to, you know, see the truth in it all, see what's going on. But, you know, I think that's a really good point you made there. If you always, always align yourself with the light, that's like a safety place. That's a, a place you go to, to feel safe and know that you're, you know, kind of in a, you're being held in a very safe space. And I always remember, actually, it's a good analogy for, uh, you know, when you experience ayahuasca, because somebody said to me that if ever you journey and you feel lost and you feel scared and you're in a dark place, a light, go back into your heart energy, you know, 
get into your heart and connect with a feeling of love because that will bring you back to a safe place. Mm. And so, you know, if you're, if you're really have, freaking out when you're experiencing plant medicine, go to your heart and you'll feel safe. It will bring you back and it would, you'll be in, a, in the right place. And I think the world is like that at the moment. So if you all, if you work on your heart energy and, you know, use meditations that put you in your heart, then you'll be in that safety space. And, you know, you don't have to think about anything or do anything when you're there. Just be in that space, you know, with an open heart. And sometimes I do that. I get people into that space just by getting them to breathe really slowly and deeply, clear their conscious mind of all thought, drop down into that space and, and then focus on someone that you love unconditionally. Mm. And for me, it's my kids. You know, I, I adore my kids with every cell and fiber, you know, like good people do, you know, normal people do, you know, and I, so I get into that space and I feel my heart opening when I focus on my kids and, you know, and then I amplify it. I just magnify it. And I think of them doing lovely things and me playing with them and all that kind of stuff. And my heart just opens more and more. And that's how I do it. I get into that really safe nurturing space. And I just sometimes stay in that for a, a length of time. And when I come back out of that, I feel so good. You know, the world feels so different. I've raised my vibration and, you know, the lower frequencies in the world are not affecting me. And, and that's it. I think so to align yourself with high vibrational things, people, um, you know, so eat super healthy for me, I'm totally vegan. Um, I exercise a lot. Um, you know, I keep my energy as clear as I can. Nicola, my wife, she sages the house every day and awesome. she has mantra music playing all the time. And, you know, be mindful of what you watch, what you read, what you listen to, because, you know, that can either raise your vibration or lower it. You know, I don't have any news in the house. I haven't watched the news for ages. And if ever I flick it on, it just seems like a noise to me. You know, it's just this fear coming out the TV. And I'm thinking, and I'm so far removed from it. I can, I just look at it and it can't connect with it at all. It just seems like these other people just making a noise. Yeah. <laughs> I love what you were sharing, <clears throat> going into your heart and trusting the journey, whatever it is, whether it's the world or a plant medicine journey. One thing I was told that I always, well, two things actually that I hold on to, and I think it, it is applicable to journeys in life right now. And that is, if it is coming, just remember it's also going. So mm. you can breathe through anything. It is not permanent right? And the yeah. other thing is, um, the first time I did medicine was, oh my God, this man is so such an exquisite musician. And he would read poetry, Rumi, wow. which wow. like for all of us, we were just done. It was so beautiful. And he would say, if something happens that makes you feel frightened or anxious or out of control, let's breathe and listen to the music. Breathe yeah. and listen to the music. It will always guide you through, you know, coming yeah. to the moment. And we're all as safe, really. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. It sounds your experience was similar to mine because the first time I journeyed, it was with um, a guy in the UK called Ali Calderwood, who's an amazing musician, really, really gifted. And, um, I was going to go down to Peru. I was, you know, so drawn to it. I was heading down there, but I happened to meet Ali. He was doing a concert down in Brighton, which is kind of a hippie sort of community in the UK. And um, he said he had an, a ceremony on Saturday. And I loved his music. I fell in love with his music the first time I heard it. It was really powerful. You know, it's very psychedelic and trippy, but it was all, he used to write it for the ceremonies. So it was very tuned to, the medicine and he'd spent time in Peru with the shamans down there. And you know, the medicine he got coming over was from a really pure source. And, and the first time I heard his music was in ceremony and I was so deep, you know, I was journeying. I was in these crystal palaces. I was in a really um, blissful part of the journey because you have blissful times and you also have very dark, frightening times. You know, you go on that whole journey, but I was in a blissful state and I heard his music and, and it just blew me away. It was like nothing I'd ever heard before. And, and I also heard the Devi prayer, you know, the Devi prayer by Craig Pruess. It's quite a, it's quite a well-known track that gets played a lot. 
And um, I'd, I'd never heard it before. It was the first time in ceremony I'd heard it. And it's this amazing mantra, amazing chant. And it was about 4 a.m. and I was on this journey and I heard this music and it just nailed me to the floor. It was just blissful. It was incredible. And I actually spoke to, a number of years later, I told Craig this story. I told him that the first time I heard that track was in a ceremony. And he was like elated that his music had been you know, connected with someone on that level, you know, he was so pleased because he kind of written it when he was in a higher state of consciousness. And yes, it's quite incredible. You know, music is a powerful part of these journeys. And, you know, in my meditations, I was always very conscious of that using music that really, um, you know, connected with what I was saying and enhanced what I was saying. And, you know, and, and a little story about that was when, after I spent a number of ceremonies with Ali Calderwood, you know, who ran this ayahuasca ceremonies, we made uh, a series of solfagio meditation recordings. And the solfagio tones are sacred tones that were recently discovered by Dr. Len Horowitz and uh, another doctor, I forget his name. And they'd recently rediscovered the tones. And these were sacred tones that Gregorian monks used to chant to invoke certain states. So, for example, 396 hertz was a frequency they used to dispel feelings of guilt and fear. So, and the 528 hertz tone is the love tone. It's in the heart and it opens the heart up. And it's actually biochemists now use that 528 hertz frequency to repair DNA. So the tones were very, very special. And myself and Ali, we scripted a number of meditations around each tone. He created the music. I spoke the meditation. And we create these powerful recordings and um, we get amazing feedback on them. I'll have to send you, I'll send you some of them. Oh. Um, and we even Dr. Len Horowitz wrote to us and said, I've heard your solfagio tones and they're the real deal. He said, I've heard a lot of other ones that, you know, that yours are spot on the money. And he actually saw at the time we were selling cassettes and he used to buy our cassettes of them and resell them. So that was a great endorsement that we created something magical, you know? And, um, yeah, they, they, I'll send them over to you because they they do get amazing feedback. I'm honored. Thank you. You know, I come from a very musical family and a deep musical background myself. And so I've always felt strongly that I've always said I actually experience life through the filter of music. Mm. That's the best way I can describe what it's like to be me. And yeah. I feel where there are often no words in the language to describe things that's where music takes over just yeah another expressive language of do you, do you play uh yeah well i was actually an extraordinary violinist for a long time and i played guitar but mostly i was a professional singer for oh, a long wow. time yeah oh, wow. from a very musical family brother grammy award-winning mother grandfather uh Wow, wow. Inventor and music and so forth. It was sort of yeah. a mud. Do you still do you still have the calling? Do you still do it? You never you never stop, do you really? Yeah, you never stop. You know, when I got into radio, I had to make a hard choice. I was starting in radio originally and then writing books, and I had, was in a band. I was the lead singer in a band and we had gigs all the time. And I just it takes work. You know, just yeah, so people know, yeah, yeah. you don't just suddenly jump up on stage and there you are. I was constantly working on my music and my vocal muscles and it was yeah. a lot in rehearsals. And I finally made the hard decision. I had to let go of the band. I didn't have to, I chose yeah. because this was yeah. an amazing path opening up for me and I'm deeply grateful I followed it. It was exactly correct. And it was yeah. a number of years, but I would say in the last couple of years, after I had this mindset, oh, I can't sing anymore, it's been too long. And it's like, of course you can. And I have been uh, singing more yeah. and more. And um, I love it. I love the yeah. expression of the voice and instruments and the sounds that things can make and that level of creativity and expression yeah. out in the world. So yes. More and more, and I'm gift. opening for that. Yeah, to have a voice is a gift because I could never sing. Mm. I always had a voice like a foghorn. <laughs> <laughs> but ironically, you know, my voice has become my fame and fortune. You know, I'm through the meditations, sure. it works on that level. But I could never sing, and it was always a frustration. 
you know, and uh, when, when I was first in a band, the, the singer was a really naturally good singer. Mm. He just had a gift, you know, and um, so, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. But, and I was never a naturally gifted musician. I had to kind of work and, you know, I'm still so-so. But my, my gift was I was, I feel I was a good songwriter. You know, I did win song comp- competitions and, um, you know, did well and, and that was my, but it was always a bit of a frustration not being able to sing the songs and really deliver. You know, I was always reliant on finding other people to do that. And that was always a bit hit and miss, you know, finding the right singers. So, yeah, but I still love it. And, you know, I, I partnered up with a, a fellow hypnotherapist who's a great singer a couple of years ago, and he sang a few of my songs and we wrote a couple of songs together. And um, it was a good journey. And we're still open to working together again. So, you know, when things settle down a bit with my hypnotherapy work, I'm going to step back into that. You know, you never lose it, do you? It's just a love. You never lose it. Right. And, you know, and I just want to speak to something you said, because I had such a gift as a child growing up in this extreme musical accomplished family. It's like, I want to say, and then there was me because um, music theory, I took it four times and it was, as though I was dyslexic. I just couldn't. It was so painful. Learning piano, so painful. Um, Yeah. There was a lot in that, that people who are more scientific and mathematical actually are genius at comprehending. My grandfather, God bless him, who was just a world-renowned author and inventor and music teacher, went around the world talking about this. He was a deeply hilarious, sensitive man. And he would say to me, because he could see my frustration, I couldn't get it like the rest of my family. And he would say to me, Debbie, there are technicians in music. And yes, that's a genius. But then there are people like you who are deeply in their heart and deeply feeling. You, my dear, feel music. You hear music and you can replicate music or put it through your filter. And it was such a gift he gave me to take that onus off of my shoulder of comparison and to recognize I have my own gift. It doesn't look, yes, it would be awesome to have theory run through my veins and understand things that still to this day don't click, but I feel music. And from that space, I give the music back out into the world. It's how you express through your feelings. Yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? It's left brain, right brain, isn't it? You know, if you're more left brain dominant, you're, you tend to be more analytic, analytical and scientific. And um, it's funny, my, my middle son, who's five, he's uh, picking up the piano already and he's got a very good memory, you know, so he can, we can show him something on the piano and he plays it back and he's only five. You know, and I could never do that. My, my older son could never do that. He's more like me, you know, kinesthetic. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting. We've that's an important distinction, isn't it, to make that we've all got our own ways of taking on board information and, and expressing it, you know, and it's different in everyone. So, and it's always this why the sort of mainstream school system doesn't work because it teaches kids a certain way. And you know, I didn't fit into the school at all, so I just rebelled and I got kicked out when I was very young, and never never fitted in at all. And you know, I thought I was stupid because I wasn't. You know, but it's just I had gifts that came out in a different way later on. And it was, you know, it took me a time to find my feet. So that that's the thing. And, you know, we're lucky now, myself and my wife, we've got that consciousness around our kids. So we would, you know, we'll guide them and lead with their own gifts. You know, their gifts will guide them and we'll nurture them that way. We're not going to push them in any direction. It's conscious living, isn't it? And that conscious and that's parenting. another way you're changing the lineage. Right? Yeah, You're doing exactly. Healing work, which is very profound for everyone who has come before you and their gr- gratitude for what you're doing. And now, even into the movement forward and what happens afterwards, that you are creating a whole different paradigm with your children. Yeah. I think that's really beautiful. And no, yeah, way. breaking the cycle, you know, the family okay. cycle, breaking the karma. Mm. I, I, we, we joke sometimes, we say we want to incarnate into their downline. <laughs> Because myself and my Nicola, she was born in East London in a place called Dagenham. Mm. 
Mm. And anyone from the UK listening, they'll know Dagenham is not the most quaint little village in the UK, shall we say. You know, it's a rough part of London. I was born in Balham, which is on the west side, and that's a rough place, you know. And, you know, so, and we incarnated into not conscious families, you know, and had the, took the hard route, you know, both had not breakdowns, but tough times where, you know, then came out of it. And now we've got this consciousness and we've got these two little kids, so we're nurturing them. So, yeah, we want to incarnate into their downline. You know, what the work we're doing now, we, there's got to be a payback, isn't there? Yes. <laughs> oh, without a doubt, you know, from, from that darkness too, we become the light to put out into the world. And I think that's really powerful to take something yeah. that could have become different. You could have chose, chosen, much like you said, the folks you're still in touch with who went to prison, you could have continued the darkness. But that's a pretty yeah. path for your soul to choose. It's like against all odds, I'm going this mm. way, I'm going to forge a path that's new. I think it is a soul choice, isn't it? You know, somebody once said to me that we make a pact with the divine when we come into this life to walk a certain path and, you know, to maybe clear more karma than, you know, if we've, if we're going to be brave, then we'll clear more karma and go through some darker times to come out the other side. And, you know, I think there's no guarantee you, you do come out the other side because I could have, you know, when I was 17, I drank myself to oblivion and I had hepatitis I woke up one morning, I was yellow. And, you know, that could have destroyed my life. Um, you know, maybe it was a blessing that it happened to me at 17 because I had, you know, I had to stop drinking after that. And then, you know, from there I started to, you know, go on a more positive, I, got a, I joined a band after that and got on a more positive path. But maybe if I'd, you know, because my family are still drinkers, you know, a lot of them are still boozers. When I get together with them, that's all they want to do, you know. Um, so maybe if I hadn't had that breakdown at that and had hepatitis, I would have carried on the family life and, you know, just been a big drinker now. I don't know. You know, so sometimes you have to go through those tough experiences to come out the other side and start rebuild, rebuild. And yeah, you know, you know I, think, I had, sorry. No. <laughs> oh, finish your thought, please. Yeah. I think it's a soul choice. I think on a soul level, you know, I think we know what to do. We know where we've got to go. And, you know, even at the darkest times I've had in this life, I, I never was too bad. I'd always wanted to do good in the world. I just didn't know how to, I was just very, very stuck. And so my soul was pulling me in a, towards the light, if you like, it was pulling me in that direction. And, you know, I think it's the soul choice ultimately, you know, and, um, yeah, you have to follow that ultimately. I had a very interesting experience a couple of days ago. I shared we were doing mushrooms on this epic hike in a place that was so magical. And it was insane that we were the, the only ones there, but this was meant to be. And then as soon as I came on, and it was pretty strong coming on, uh, there was this incredible heaviness. And somehow for whatever reason the information that came up for me was um, i also grew up in a really interesting home incredibly unstable and not nurturing and i just realized the sadness of how unsafe i felt growing up mm. and how much that has colored my whole life mm. i mean it was like a mantle of heaviness when i it, you know just acknowledged it to myself yeah. And the next thought I had was like, well, life isn't like that anymore, Deb. So why don't we just move on from here? Mm -hmm. And then this voice of wisdom came and said, you've been doing that your whole life. Why don't you just feel what it felt like to be, oof, it's like emotional, to be that unsafe growing up, yeah. to be in this for a yeah, moment, yeah. Yourself a breath to allow that to course through you because it is true. It's exactly what it was like for you. We don't have yeah. to pretend otherwise. We don't have to positive away, affirm it away. You can just be in the truth of what you went through as a kid. Mm. And I just breathed into it and allowed whatever that was. Um, you know, I had some tears coming up and, and just like the oof, the head is incredible, the heaviness. And yeah. 
what I love about allowing things like that is the unexpected transmutation that occurs. Because mm. I think the concern of why we try to wish things away or change our mindset is because, oh, I'll be in this forever. And the truth yeah, is yeah. when we allow it, I just know for me, when I allow it, that's when this transportation happens. It's like energy yeah. is energy and like poof. And I have to tell you, I was almost peeing in my pants the rest of the day because everything then was hilarious to me after that. Like everything was so funny and light and <laughs> I was laughing like constantly I was having really the best time and plus the amazement <laughs> about the beauty around me and I think that's there's this profundity in that right about the yeah. darkness coming up but it actually is coming up to be healed uh, yeah and being and the a brave person in the family system to take this shit on if you will like I'm, I'm gonna brave this crap that my whole yeah. family's been going through probably everybody hasn't felt safe and like let's just be with this for a minute yeah <laughs> and know? that's that's the wisdom that's the wisdom knowing that when it came up in you you worked with it you went with it and you processed it and you experienced it now from an adult perspective an adult conscious perspective you know, when you were a kid, you might try to make sense of that, not feeling safe, that unsafe environment from a child's perspective, you know, so being able to re-experience it from an adult conscious perspective, it's a massive way to heal and purge it. And that's amazing. And that's what really good therapy is all about. You know, and what an amazing experience. And, and, you know, kudos to the mushrooms for bringing that on. <laughs> totally and if it's coming it's going if it's coming it's going just remember breathe and listen to the music <laughs> even if it's yeah. the forest singing to you you know you got this you really more than you know you've got this so yeah yeah glenn That's what a amazing conversation wow yeah i've loved yes, it i've loved it too so much um i knew this would be wonderful but this was even beyond so i'm so mm. grateful this is dare to dream i am really curious what do you next dare to dream? So sorry, I think I was, um, I was in somewhere else then. Yeah, I think I was thinking about the mushrooms. <laughs> I've got to, got because it's funny. I haven't done mushrooms for a long, long time. I did them when I was young, but it was always from an unconscious place. You know, we just did them to kind of get out of it and have. But now doing it from a conscious place, I'm I'm drawn to that. So sorry about that. Yeah. What do so? What do I dare to dream at the moment? I suppose it's to, to continue to live a more abundant, happy, prosperous life and to really continue to work on my, you know, my, my shadow and my things that come up, you know, and that's in the relationship I've got with Nick and, you know, my relationship with my kids, you know, I want to nurture them and bring them into a wonderful, prosperous, abundant life as well. And you know, be their support and that kind of thing. So it's really because I've experienced so many highs recently and not sort of, you know, highs that come from status or, you know, money or anything like that. Highs from the heart. And they, it's funny, my, my son and my oldest son, as I said, he's part of the Krishna consciousness group. And he said, he's been chanting in a forest somewhere in Hungary. And he phoned me up and he said, I had this Daddy said, I had this amazing experience. I was chanting for three hours in the forest with the Christians. We were drumming and playing the music. And he said, I, I tasted the nectar. Uh. And the Krishna guys call it nectar when you have that utter bliss. You know, you're in these higher dimensions. And, and I've experienced that. And I've had taste of that recently again. And I want to experience more of that. And so that's, that's the dream. That's where I want to continue to try and move towards and, you know, even in this dark world, we can do that. Especially in this dark world, we should do that. If you would like more folks, glennherald.com, G-L-E-N-N-H-A-R-R-O-L-D.com. And also, if you'd like his free gift, highly recommended. He's giving you one of his hypnosis mindfulness meditations for free. Just find the track and the link. It is in the notes on youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, as well as Apple Podcasts and all the other radio stations and sites that we are on. And is there anything you'd like to say here at the end, Glenn? 
I think just, um, you know, thank you for a lovely interview. I've really enjoyed it. And you know, it sounds like we've had similar paths, you know, being musicians and that feeling unsafe as a kid, all that kind of stuff. And, and um, yeah, I think for anyone listening, just know that, you know, this is a golden opportunity, this life. You know, we incarnate into this life to, you know, have the opportunity to clear so much and to be the best version of ourselves we can possibly be, to raise our vibration, expand our consciousness. And that's the real gift. That's the opportunity that, you know, we can leave such a mark in the world in, in a positive way with our family, clear our car family karma, all of that stuff. So it's a golden opportunity, this life. And I think that's the, that's the overriding message. Mm. Thank you so much. And I end the show with this quote from Deepak Chopra, receiving is as necessary as giving. To graciously receive is an expression of the dignity of giving. Those who are unable to receive are actually incapable of giving. Giving and receiving are different aspects of the flow of energy in the universe. Subscribe to this number one transformational conversation, Dare to Dream, and leave us a review so other people can find the show who need to listen and follow along being part of the tribe. Next upcoming guest on the show is Daryl Anka. Daryl Anka channels Bashar, who's a multidimensional being who speaks through Daryl. It'll be his second time on the show. And remember, for all you Dare to Dreamers out there, don't just dare to dream. Dare to create all your dreams into your reality. And if you need any assistance, you've now got a friend in Glenn Harold. Listen to his hypnosis recordings, and you'll see what they can do for you at glennharold.com. Thanks for joining us today. <laughs>